this subject in a very unusual way. And it started in 2010. My husband and I were moving from California to Boston. And I was, ex I'm sorry, sorry. Yeah, I'm going to turn it up here. Yeah. I think I've got it on. There yeah, we go. You've got it on. That sounds better. Uh, so this all really started in 2010 for me. Uh, when my husband and I were moving to Boston, and I was expecting our first child, and we were just having this incredibly difficult time coming up with names. We made these long lists of names. Nothing seemed right. And it was finally my husband who suggested the name Eleanor Francis. And when I first heard the name, I wasn't really sure, because this is an old-fashioned name. I, I wasn't sure if it would be right for our baby girl. And so I did what parents do these days, and I Googled the name. And the first person to pop up in my search was a woman named Eleanor Francis Helene. And my browser was suddenly filled with this lovely picture of her taken in the 1960s, where she's accepting an award at NASA. And when I saw this picture, I was just stunned. I have a PhD in microbiology. I consider myself well-versed in the contributions of female scientists. But I realized that I had never heard about the women that worked at NASA during this time. Although I had heard about the Mercury 13 and the many women who wanted to be part of the space program, I had never heard about women actually contributing to NASA during this remarkable period in our history. And so I knew I wanted to learn more. And what I found out was that Eleanor Francis Helene was not alone. She was one of a large group of women. And they all worked at this place called the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. Now, this laboratory was not founded by the type of people you would expect. It was founded by a very wild group that were known as the Suicide Squad. And they got this name because of the very dangerous experiments they performed at the Caltech campus, where some of them were students and some of them just really liked to fire off rockets. So they sent up this fountain of nitrogen dioxide that ruined landscaping. They then set off an explosion in the engineering building that rusted a new and very expensive wind tunnel. And then finally, they blasted off the side of a building, sending bricks just raining down on students below. And it was at this point that the Caltech administrators finally decided, OK, this is enough. You guys have to leave campus. And so this is where they went, to this isolated canyon outside Pasadena. And they started firing their rockets there. And it's important to note that at this period in history, Rocket science is really considered a fringe science. So this is the late, mid to late 1930s. And no serious scientist or engineer would really want to identify themselves as a rocket scientist. And in fact, the professors of this group told them, what you're doing is impossible. You'll never be able to get a rocket into space. By 1939, however, they were starting to have some legitimacy to their experiments. And they were able to get the US government's first grant for rocket research. And with this, they hired their first employees. And this was a couple named Richard and Barbie Canwright, who were friends of the group. And they were hired as computers. So before all of the digital devices that we have today, a computer meant simply a person that computes. And laboratories would hire large numbers of these men and women who were gifted in math to perform the calculations for their experiments. So Richard and Barbie Canwright started working with the Suicide Squad on a project called the Rocket Plane, or JADO. So this is called Jet Assisted Takeoff. And the idea here is that they're strapping on their rockets to these light fixed wing aircraft and then firing them and hoping that it's going to give these aircraft a big boost. 
And their goal here is to be able to adapt this technology to one day power bombers over the Pacific. And they end up having some success. This is the group on the airfield. You can see Barbie sticks out in her skirt. And with their success, they now got another grant from the US government to further this technology. And so Richard Canwright was then promoted to the position of engineer, but Barbie was not. Even though she had very similar education and experience, men at this time were engineers and women were really limited to being computers. So with Richard Canwright promoted, the laboratory needed some new computers. So they hired two women and one man. And one of the women would end up being very important to the future of the lab. And her name was Macy Roberts. And in 1941, Macy Roberts was made supervisor of the computing section. And in this role, she decided that as she hired new computers, as she filled her group, she was going to hire only women. So obviously, you couldn't do this today. This would be a lawsuit. But back then, her thinking was that if she hired a man, they simply wouldn't listen to her because she was a woman. And so Macy hired a lot of women. They came from all over the country. She tended to prefer women, actually, that were raised on the East Coast, as she believed that the schools were better. And so they had all different types of education and background. Many of them had advanced degrees. The woman in the center is named Janez Lawson. She was the first African-American hired in a technical position in the lab. And she had a degree in chemical engineering from UCLA. So today, she would just be hired as an engineer. Back then, she was hired as a computer. So these women with just paper and pencil and these very clunky machines called Frieden calculators were responsible for calculating the potential of different rocket propellants and looking at the trajectories of early missiles. So they were working on the corporal missile, this very large missile that stood 39 feet tall, and the sergeant missile, which was a bit of a smaller surface-to-surface -surface missile. And really, neither of these projects ended up being very important from a military perspective, but where they were important was in space exploration. And we really see that by the 1950s where this group is working on a project called Jupiter-C. And to do this, they are taking a scaled-down version of the sergeant missile that the women call baby sergeants. And they're strapping them together like this, placing them in these large spinning tubs, and then placing these spinning tubs in stages, all on top of a big redstone rocket. And at its peak, there's a single baby sergeant whose goal is to launch the world's first satellite. And on September 20th, 1956, they launched Jupiter-C. It is a very exciting moment in mission control for this group of women. They watch as Jupiter-C breaks all records for the time, for speed, for altitude. It rises 3,335 miles into the air. But at its peak, there is no satellite. In fact, it's actually weighed down by sandbags. And the reason for this is that the Eisenhower administration hadn't greenlighted their launch of a satellite. And so because of that, Jupiter-C, which could have launched the world's first satellite a year ahead of time, wasn't able to. And it wasn't until a year later, in October 1957, that the Soviet Union launched Sputnik. And you can imagine how frustrating it was for the members of the lab. The women that I talked to about this were still bitter. They were still angry about this. And it actually wasn't until a second Sputnik was launched a month later that the Eisenhower administration finally gave them the go ahead. And so they were free to get their plans together. And on January 31st, 1958, they were ready to launch the first American satellite. Now, there were many women in the control room that night. And as you can imagine, this is, this is quite a tense moment. There's a lot riding on this. Already, there have been several failed launches, not from JPL, but from the Navy Vanguard Group, which was trying to launch a satellite first. And so there's a lot of pressure on JPL to prove itself with this mission. 
And so for the women in mission control, they are excited, they are nervous. And there's one woman in particular who is really feeling worried, and her name is Barbara Paulson. And that evening, she is the one responsible for calculating the trajectory of the satellite as it leaves Earth. And so to do this, she is sitting at a light table in mission control. She's got her graph paper and her pencils. She is calculating this all by hand. And standing over her shoulder are Richard Feynman, the famous physicist, and Lee Dubridge, who is then president of Caltech. And everyone in the room is waiting on her calculations to find out if this mission is going to be a success. And when she calculates that, yes, Explorer 1 has made it, it is America's first satellite, the room just erupts in celebration. It is a great moment. And in that moment, NASA is born. Everything changes after Explorer 1. The women will never work on weaponry again and are now focused on space exploration. Things are changing for Barbara, too. In 1958, Macy Roberts retires. And Barbara, who has now been working at the lab for a decade, she was actually hired when she was a teenager, is now promoted to the position of supervisor. And there are a lot of questions when this happens, because she's a young woman. She's 30 years old. And there's a lot of fear that, unlike Macy Roberts, who was older and, and more established, there's fears that she is going to get married and get pregnant and leave the lab in a bad situation. And a year later, that's pretty much what happens. <laughs> Barbara gets married. And a year after that, she's now pregnant. And in 1960, only 25% of mothers worked outside the home. So Barbara knows that this is going to be difficult, but she decides she loves her job. She loves being supervisor. She feels that her work is indispensable. And so she decides that she is going to try to stay and keep her job. At eight months pregnant, however, Barbara applies for a better parking spot at the lab, citing her pregnancy as the reason. And when the administration finds out about this, they immediately fire her. They tell her that being pregnant is a liability and that she has to pack up her things and leave that day. As you can imagine, Barbara is devastated. She goes home to her husband, Harry, and she cries, I thought I was worth more than that. Now, fortunately, Barbara is able to come back and have a 45-year career at NASA. And she's able to do so thanks to the woman that replaces her as supervisor of the computers. And that woman's name is Helen Lang. She's standing up in the second row here. Now, Helen was also hired by Macy Roberts. She was hired in 1953. And after Barbara is fired, Helen is now made supervisor of this group. But like Barbara, she is at an age where she's about to get married. She's about to have kids. So she learns from Barbara's example. She doesn't apply for any parking spots. <laughs> and she actually hides her pregnancy as long as she can. And then when it's time to have the baby, she uses combined vacation and sick time in order to have enough time off. Now, Helen decides that it's not enough for her just to come back. She wants to bring back other women and other mothers to the lab after they have kids. And so she does this using a technology that we rarely take advantage of today, telephone. <laughs> so after women leave the lab and have their children, they can soon expect a phone call from Helen asking them to come back. And by doing this and really supporting each other, becoming close friends, the women are able to create a culture of working motherhood that simply did not exist in the lab before them. Now, this is all happening at a very interesting time, because IBM computers that have been in the lab for well, about a decade at this point are only now, in the 1960s, really gaining prominence at NASA. And what I found in my research was that at other NASA centers, once IBM computers came in, the people that worked as computers were largely fired. This did not happen at JPL. Instead, it was actually the women who became the first computer programmers at the lab. And this is really due to the respect that they had there, the relationships that they had with their colleagues. Um, of course, JPL was, in some ways, a very 
progressive place in comparison to other NASA centers. Because it was founded by the Suicide Squad, because of its academic affiliation with Caltech, there was a, a lot more leniency among the people there. People felt a bit freer than they did at other NASA centers, which tended to have a more military style administration. So despite the progressive nature, however, of JPL, they were still, of course, subject to gender norms of the day. And one of the ones I was most surprised at were the beauty contests. I was really shocked when I found all of these photographs of beauty contests at JPL. It's sort of hard to imagine NASA doing this over decades. And as ridiculous as the contests are by today's standards, they were first called Misguided Missile and then later renamed Queen of Outer Space. Um, and so as silly as they are, in a way, they do reflect the progressive hiring policies of the lab. No other NASA center could have held a beauty contest because they simply didn't hire enough women. Now, my favorite beauty contest story takes place with the Ranger missions in the 1960s. And so this is Ranger 6, and it launches in 1964. And the whole goal of this mission is to have this unmanned spacecraft that is able to take close-up pictures of the lunar surface in preparation for Apollo. So it's looking at different landing sites that might be safe for astronauts. And at this point, there have already been five failures of the Ranger missions. It ended up being very difficult to get to the moon. And so for Ranger 6, you can imagine what the pressure is on the people at JPL. They really know that if this mission is not a success, it is very likely that it will be taken completely away from them. And so on February 2nd, 1964, the director of the lab, Bill Pickering, is in DC waiting for the live feed from the spacecraft from the moon. And listening in to this feed is also President Johnson. And everything is very quiet until they suddenly hear a voice floating in, spray on Avon and walk in fragrant beauty. Everyone kind of looks at each other thinking, where is this voice coming from? Surely this is not coming from the moon. And then they realize that at JPL, they have switched the feeds from the ongoing Queen of Outer Space contest with the live feed from Ranger 6. <laughs> an incredibly embarrassing moment. But even more embarrassing is when they learn that Ranger 6 has also failed. And it's not until Ranger 7 that we finally get those close-up pictures of the Sea of Tranquility, which then paves the way, of course, in 1969 for Apollo. And the women's fingerprints are, are really all over this mission, not just because of the Ranger and the other early spacecraft that were sent to the moon by JPL, um, but also the rocket and propellant technology that was helped develop at JPL. And even those first words, one small step, was made possible because of the deep space network that the women spent an incredible amount of time developing. So something else quite remarkable happened in 1969, and that's that the women finally became engineers. This was uh, an incredible moment for them to finally be getting the recognition and the salary increase that they deserved. Um, and you can imagine for Helen Ling how it felt to be, still be supervisor of this group and, and to watch her group finally obtain this. However, Helen decides that she wants to grow her numbers. And this is not so easy because many engineering schools at the time still did not admit women. Caltech, for example, didn't open its doors to women until 1970. And so Helen decides she is going to find women who have bachelor degrees, in math and science, hire them, and then train them in the lab, encourage them to go to night school. And by doing this, she is able to fill the lab with female engineers who otherwise would never have gotten in the door. And there are many examples of the women that Helen built up this way. One of them is a woman named Sylvia Miller. Sylvia got her bachelor's in math from Douglas College in New Jersey. And in 1968, she moved out to California. She was hired by Helen and encouraged by her to go to night school. 
Sylvia then went on, she became a, a very recognized engineer in the lab. By the 1970s, she was working on a project called the Grand Tour. And this was a very audacious project that had been around for already about a decade. People had planned that they wanted to take advantage of this once in 270 year alignment of the planets in order to be able to send a spacecraft out all the way to the outer planets. So they wanted to go to Jupiter and Saturn and Neptune and Uranus. But by 1970, NASA had very large budget cuts and so the Grand Tour was canceled. And it was actually Sylvia and a small group of engineers who came in one weekend and decided that they wanted to save the mission. And they did this in a very bold way. Using a technique called gravity assist, they then created this new trajectory that would use the gravitational pull of the planets to act kind of like a giant slingshot and send the spacecraft farther and farther into space. So this is an uncrewed spacecraft. And by doing this, they were able to reduce the size of the spacecraft and save on fuel costs. These were launched in 1977 as the Voyagers, and they not only changed textbooks, but they gave us all of these incredible images of our solar system. And when I interviewed the women, they had such incredible memories of what it was like to see these images for the first time at JPL. Now, Sylvia went on. She became a program manager at the Mars Research Office at JPL, and she and Helen and Barbara and this core group of women sent rovers into the red planet and, and did quite a bit of work um, exploring Mars. So in 2013, I brought this group of women back to JPL. I held this reunion um, and we had all of these women who spent 40, 50, even 60 years working at NASA. And you can imagine how amazing it was to tour the lab with them, to hear their memories firsthand. But I have to admit, of all the surprising things that I heard over this weekend, one of the most surprising was how much they had been forgotten by the lab. So when I first started researching their stories and first started going through the archives, I found all of these amazing pictures of them, and yet very few of their names were known, and the labs had lost all of their contact information. And so because of that, the women have been left out of quite a bit. And one example of that is that in 2008, NASA held a big gala in honor of the 50th anniversary of Explorer 1, America's first satellite. But they didn't invite any of the women that were present for that mission, not even Barbara Paulson, who was such a critical member of that team's success. For me, however, the biggest disappointment has been Sue Finley. So Sue Finley was hired by Macy Roberts in 1958, and she still works in the lab today. She is NASA's longest serving female employee. But in 2004, NASA decided to make a new rule where if you do not have an advanced degree, you cannot hold the title of engineer. And so because of that, they took that title that she had won with Helen in 1969, and they, they took that away from her. Now, this of course disappointed Sue, but she loves her job, she loves her work at JPL, and she really has no plans of retiring. She's currently working on Juno, which is our mission to Jupiter. So I wanted to write this book and tell their stories, not only because these women are so deserving of recognition, um, but also hopefully for other young people interested in science and engineering. And what we're seeing today is a very large drop in the number of women pursuing computer science in particular. So in 1984, 37% of all bachelor degrees in computer science were awarded to women. And today that number has dropped to 18%. So hopefully by having role models, this can, we can help encourage young people, particularly women, um, to, to pursue computer science. And of course, there are many bright spots in what is happening today. One of them is that 2016 marks the first year that the NASA class of astronauts is half women. And at JPL, there are more women employed at every level than any other NASA center. And that is really thanks to Helen and Barbara and Sue 
and this amazing group of women that paved the way and, and even helped hire many of these women. So we did name our daughter Eleanor Francis. She is named in part for a woman who, unfortunately, I never had the chance to meet. She died a year before my Eleanor Francis was born. But I hope her name and her story will one day inspire my daughter. So thank you so much, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have.